O Lord, open our lips, and our mouths shall proclaim your praise. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to St. Saviour's Online. Today is the first Sunday of the month of June, June 6th, in the year 2021, and it's the second Sunday after the Feast of Pentecost. As we gather together today, we want to acknowledge that our community gathers within the ancestral, traditional, and unceded territory of the Silk people of the Okanagan Nation. We want to commit ourselves to the ongoing work of reconciliation, which is alive and at work in our midst, in our communities, in our lives as a church, in our lives as Canadian citizens. We want to recommit ourselves to that work today and every day. As we begin and enter into prayer this morning, we're going to enter in with a confession and absolution. And so, my dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness. And bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Come, thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious measure, Sung by flaming tongues above. O oh, the vast, the boundless treasure Of my God's unchanging love. Here I make faith's affirmation, Thus far by thy help I've come, And I hope by thy come Jesus sought me when a stranger 
stranger wandering from the fold of God. He do rescue me from danger, interpose his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, by my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Take my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Friends, the night has passed and the day lies open before us. Let's pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, both now and forever. Amen. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, You are old, and your sons do not follow in your ways. Appoint for us then a king to govern us like other nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to govern us. Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Just as they have done to me, from the day I brought them up out of Egypt to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so also they are doing to you. Now then, listen to their voice. Only, you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel reported all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, These will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plough his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his courtiers. He will take one tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and his courtiers. He will take your male and female slaves and the best of your cattle and donkeys and put them to his work. He will take one tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day, you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. They said, no, but we are determined to have a king over us so that we may also be like other nations and that our king may govern us and go out before us and fight our battles. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods will I sing your praise. I will bow down toward your holy temple and praise your name because of your love and faithfulness. For you have glorified your name and your word above all things. When I called, you answered me. You increased my strength within me. All the kings of the earth will praise you, O Lord, when they have heard the words of your mouth. They will sing of the ways of the Lord, that great is the glory of the Lord. Though the Lord be high, he cares for the lowly, He perceives the haughty from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you keep me safe. You stretch forth your hand against the fury of my enemies. Your right hand shall save me. 
the Lord will make good his purpose for me. O Lord, your love endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. But just as we have the same spirit of faith that is in accordance with scripture, I believed and so I spoke, we also believe and so we speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will bring us with you into his presence. Yes, everything is for your sake, so that grace as it extends to more and more people may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure, because we look not at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Then Jesus entered a house. And again, a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, he is possessed by Beelzebul, by the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. So Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the, the strong man's house. Truly, I tell you, people will be forgiven all their sins and all the blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven and is guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying, he has an evil spirit. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mothers, my mother and my brothers? He asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. The Lord is with us. God is our stronghold. God will help at the break of day. The Lord is with us. God is our stronghold. God will help at the break of day. God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble. God will help at the break of day. We will not fear, though the earth be moved and though the mountains be toppled into the depths of the sea. God will help at the break of day. Come now and look upon the works of the Lord, what awesome things he has done on earth. God will help at the break of day. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. God will help at the break of day. 
Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. The Lord is with us. God is our stronghold. God will help at the break of day. You have raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of your servant David. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets, God promised of old to save us from our enemies, from the hands of all that hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors, and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath God swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. And you, child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of all their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory be to God, source of all being, eternal word, and Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. You have raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of your servant, David. I come to you in the name of God, the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sustainer. Amen. When I was much, much younger, I used to love telling stories. I think in both kindergarten and in grade one, I ended up in the storytelling finals for my class where I got to tell the two stories of uh, Louis Pasteur for the first year, I believe, and Purple Turtles Don't Do Drugs for the second year in front of the entire elementary school in the gym. Somehow, by the time high school came around, all of that had changed. I don't know what it was, but the thought of speaking in public would terrorize me, leave me lying awake at nights, leaving me sweating and shaking while I was doing it. I have this distinct memory of grade 7 or 8 public speaking where I ended up having to offer some reflections on the timeless Atticus Finch quote, you never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view, until you climb into his skin and walk around in it. I think that was one of the very first times that I started to recover just a little bit of the joy I'd once found in public speaking. And I think part of it had to do with the fact that there was so much richness and depth to that idea that it forced me to explore areas of reflection that I'd I'd never really considered before. That quote has always stayed with me, too, a reminder of the basis of empathy that underlies or is meant to underlie all of our social encounters, right? You never really know a person until you walk a mile in their shoes, as the saying goes. Of course, none of us can actually ever fully understand life through someone else's eyes. We can't know what it's like to live in their lives, not fully. But we can seek to understand and try to imagine the world through their eyes. And sometimes that's the hardest step to take. I think that line is also a helpful basis for thinking about something like biblical hermeneutics or the theory of interpretation, the ways that we interpret and read the Bible. We have a tendency when reading the scriptures, right, to to read those old familiar tales and stories, the ones that we've told over and over again in our lives, especially if we've grown up in the church, from a very particular perspective and a very particular point of view. And in some ways, every culture does that. Every person brings their own personhood, their own story to that reading. But sometimes we get used to thinking about the stories in particular ways, and we we start to assume that we know 
exactly who the good guys and the bad guys are in the stories. One of the most eye-opening experiences when reading the scriptures, especially those really familiar stories, is to read your way through a story from the perspective of someone that you might never place at the center of things. Thinking of today's story, I wonder about what things must have been like for people like the scribes, or people like Jesus' mother, or his sisters, or his brothers. It seems like a recurring theme in Mark's Gospel account that the people who are closest to Jesus don't come across in a very good light because they never quite understand what exactly is happening with the ministry that Jesus is carrying out. The only people in Mark's gospel who seem to understand what Jesus is doing is A, the demons, and B, the, the sort of the foreigners, the outsiders, um, to whom Jesus is doing these miraculous things. The disciples, for instance, though closest knit group, the, the, the people who are closest to Jesus in his life, they bumble their way through the entire story of Mark's gospel account, looking like a group of terrible misfits, like they have no idea what's going on. Jesus' own nuclear family never seems to understand what his deal is, and they try to stop him from whatever it is he's getting up to. And the scribes and the Pharisees, those we typically read in as Jesus' enemies. But the people who are really Jesus' best dialogue partners, the ones with whom he wrestles about matters of scripture, they're the ones who are constantly asking questions, trying to make sense of how these seemingly new teachings from this northern preacher line up with the history of the law and the prophets that they've inherited, and they don't understand it time and time again. I wonder if Jesus were to stand in front of us today and to say all the same things that he said 2,000 years ago, what might we think about his gospel? The basis of our identity as Christians today is that we are the people of God, the people who are near to Jesus, who look to Jesus for our understanding, for our very lives. It's easy then, I think, for us to fall into the trap of locating ourselves on Team Jesus, assuming that everything that we believe to be good and true about ourselves is what Jesus himself is proud of and happy with and what Jesus himself would do. Of course, there's nothing wrong with wanting and working to be on the same page as Jesus. Surely that is what we are called to do. But when we get comfortable in our belief that just because we're the church or just because we are Christians, we're automatically on the right side of things, that is specifically when disaster strikes. The problem with the attitudes of the scribes and the family of Jesus on that day wasn't that they, they stood opposed to God and religion and all of the good things in life. It wasn't even necessarily that they had the wrong values at heart. The problem that the scribes and the family members of Jesus faced was the same problem that we face today all the time. It's that they saw everything that was happening through the ministry of Jesus, and they allowed their desire for stability and safety to override their appreciation for the wild and chaotic work of the Spirit of God on the move in their midst. The work that Jesus was doing in the Galilee, it wasn't calm and it wasn't simple spiritual work. This wasn't the pleasantness of meditation. It was the difficult and chaotic work of casting out demons, of bringing dead people back to life, of reintegrating people into the communities and rebuilding their entire social lives, reconnecting the lepers to the rest of the community, giving sight to the blind. It was about drawing greater and stronger connections between people who never would have given a second thought to each other if passing on the street. It was about reminding people that each 
and every single person that they encountered was a child of God. And that that means something. That they are deserving of respect. That they hold integrity as the very fire of God burning within them. And that frightened the establishment. The scribes, the Pharisees. Because it upset that very precarious balance that they'd worked so hard to come to terms with in relation to the imperial government of their time, the Romans, where they were left to do their own thing. All of this upset Jesus' family because destabilizing that relative peace of the temple authorities meant bringing attention and danger to yourself and most likely to your family as well. And that fear meant that they pushed back against the liberating work of the Holy Spirit moving in their midst. They blasphemed against the Holy Spirit by believing that the Spirit of God would only ever look and act in ways that made them comfortable, in ways that they already knew and were familiar with. I wonder how much would have been different if the scribes and if Jesus' family had seen what he was doing and they tried to understand it through his eyes, or through the eyes of the people whose lives he was liberating from bondage and sickness and isolation. I wonder how much would have been different if teachers had listened to the power of the Spirit speaking in the home languages of the children who ran away from the residential schools, if the church had listened to the Spirit speaking through the voice of elders who fought to reclaim their children and their rights to raise them in their communities with their families of love and support. If all of Canadian society had listened to the Spirit speaking through the voice of people like Peter Bryce, who issued a report in 1907 decrying the atrocities of the residential school system, at every point in history, the choice has been before us. Trust the Spirit of God. Learn to know and recognize the Spirit of God who is leading us out in courage to renew and respect the integrity of all creation or rely on the safety and security of what we know and we're familiar with. Just as it was far back in Jesus' day, so it is now. Today, we stand in the shoes of the scribes, faced with the difficult and liberating work of the Holy Spirit to bring hidden truths to light, to begin to right the sins of history. Will we fail on our own sense of safety and security and propriety? Or will we follow that spirit blowing through our lives, leading us out in truth, reconciliation, in grace and in hope. In confidence, we offer our Sunday prayers to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. That the church may always fix its gaze on the life that lasts forever, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. That all the children of Adam and Eve may be rescued from ignorance, disobedience, and death. We pray, Lord, for those mourning the loss of the children found at the residential school in Kamloops. Let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. That those who strive to build God's kingdom may enjoy the understanding of their families. Let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. That we may be filled with the power to amend our lives and to seek forgiveness from those we wrong. Open our eyes to the racism which is present in our community, to stand up to the people who have little tolerance for those who are different. Let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. 
that our church may remain bound together in fidelity and compassion. Help us to understand and to help those who find themselves homeless. Let us pray to the Lord saying, Lord, have mercy. That all those who gather around this table may find trustworthy brothers and sisters. Let us pray to the Lord saying, Lord, have mercy. That you would give wisdom to those in authority in every land and give to all people the desire of righteousness and peace with the will to work together in trust, to seek the common good, and to share with justice the resources of the earth. Let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. We pray for the Anglican Cycle of Prayer, the Church of the Province of Myanmar in Burma, in the Diocese of Kootenai, the Most Reverend Lynn McNaughton, Parish of Kootenai Summits, St. Andrews, St. George's, Trail, Neil Elliott, Incumbent, Martha Fish Priest, Margaret Sherwood Deacon, St. Paul Salmo, Jennifer Mobes Deacon, St. John the Evangelist Fruitvale, Doug Lewis, Elizabeth Lewis, and John Rudder, Honorary Assistants. In the Anglican Church of Canada, the theological colleges and training programs within the Ecclesiastical Province of Ontario, Canterbury College, Huron College, Renison College, the Anglican Studies Program at St. Paul University, Thornlow University, Trinity College, and Wycliffe College. In the Evangelical Lutheran Church, the College at the University of Regina and Luther College High School. In the Anglican Council of Indigenous Peoples, pray for the Indigenous Peoples in the Diocese of Brenton, that all the sick and suffering may be healed. Please join me as we pray for Allie, Allison, Alice, Andrea, Art, B. Bruce, Callie, Doug, Chris, Chris S., Craig, Dan, Dave and Bev, Dylan, Effie, Eric and Dan, Frank S., Frida and Grant, Gabe, Gavin, Jean F., Ian, Jake, Janessa, Janet, Jeff H., Ken, Lou, Luke, Margareta, Margie, Nathan and Chloe, Peter, Peter B., Ryan, Spencer, and Diana. Virginia. Special prayers for Margie that her heart surgery is successful. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the communion of the Holy Spirit with Mary, the mother of God, and with the saints, let us commend our lives and the lives of one another to the Lord. God of loving kindness, you have ordered all things for our benefit. Listen to our prayers and answer them with blessing. This we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. O oh God, you have assured the human family of eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Deliver us from the death of sin and raise us to new life in him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, both now and forever. Amen. Let us pray with confidence as our Savior Christ has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Ever understand? We are sent. 
meant to walk with compassion, live out God's love, my heart and my hand. And we cry glory, 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 glory to God who presses us all. Once again, everyone, good morning and welcome to St. Saviour's Online on this second Sunday after the Feast of Pentecost and on the first Sunday of June, June 6th. It's good to be gathered with you today. Um, some notes about upcoming events in the parish this week. We have Centering Prayer as normal on Friday morning at 9.30. We have Hymn Sing on Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. This coming week's Hymn Sing will be um, favorite childhood hymns. So all of your favorites. If you have something that you'd like to request, please let Alice know or me. Um, we have coffee hour following the service today and next Sunday as always. Um, please do feel free to join us if you're around at this time um, on Zoom. Links for that are all in parish life. We are well underway now, a week almost underway in our Bible Scripture Challenge for the summer of 2021. I hope some of you are, uh, are plugging along with that. Um, the challenge is to read through the entirety of the New Testament in 90 days this summer. And so that's about three chapters a day. All the information for that is available on the parish website there's a link to it in Parish Life, the newsletter as well. Um, it's three chapters a day, absolutely doable. You can do this. Um, do join along if you are at all inclined to. And if you need a Bible, let me know. We have some at the office at the church. As mentioned over the past few weeks, we're starting a new series, a speaker series throughout this summer and most likely going to next year as well, but we're going to run the trial through the summer. It's going to be happening on the second Tuesday of the month. That means that our very first session is going to be this week on Tuesday evening from 6.30 p.m. until 8 p.m. And that's going to be held on Zoom for now. Um, the theme this week is the changing face of the church. So some trends in the changing face of the church. And we'll be talking about the sort of long scope of the history of the church, but also some of the patterns that are emerging now today as we see them. Um, I'm going to be leading this one. It'll be a mix of, um, of discussion and lecture based. Um, I do invite you to come along if you'd like and bring friends if you'd like to. Um, again, that's this Tuesday, at 6.30 p.m. on Zoom. Hope to see you there. This week on Wednesday, we're also going to be organizing a special liturgy and service of lament and prayer for the 215 plus children found at the Indian Residential School in Kamloops. Um, this is going to be a time mostly for our communities to gather together and to pray and to lament. It is specifically not a time um, of action, outward action. Um, there will be occasions for that and there will be times for that. But as has been requested by a number of Indigenous organizations, 
we want to offer space for um, for sorrow and for healing to begin before we start um, actively engaging in actions and activities. Um, at the moment, that's currently scheduled for Wednesday at 3 p.m. It'll be held on Zoom, and it's going to be held together with some of the other churches in the city, um, uh, some of our partners, especially the, the United and Lutheran churches. Um, there will be more details available about that soon this week. Um, we'll send out a special um, email to the parish if there is something um, when we have more information about that. But just so that you can mark it on your calendars, uh, at the moment that's planned for Wednesday at 3 p.m. Now I want to wish you all a good and blessed and holy week. And we're going to end our worship this morning by singing together our final hymn. Now, friends, go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Heal and help the afflicted. Show love to everyone. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you this day and forevermore. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.